Amen. Let's give her another hand. What a great intro to talking about using your talents and your gifts. And uh, we are continuing our series today on the gifts. This is part four. This will be the last time we go uh, to this passage and to uh, this topic. Uh, we'll be wrapping this up today and uh, look forward to what God is going to say to us this morning. Uh, just by way of review, we have many, many things we've already talked about in terms of spiritual gifts. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, you've heard them. If you haven't, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to the gifts and this sermon series. We talked about prophecy the first week, the gift of prophecy. Uh, we talked about the gift of service. We've talked about the gift of teaching, exhortation, the gift of giving, leadership, and we finished up last week with the gift of mercy. So we've talked about a lot of the gifts, and uh, today we're going to try to get in a lot more. There will be a few that may not make the list, but that's okay. We'll talk about that at the end. Um, but I want you to just take a moment and think about spiritual gifts in general and what happens at a birthday party. We're about to celebrate the birth of Christ here in a few days, and uh, Christmas is so close. And, um, you know, at birthday parties, there are always what? Presents, right? People, cake. That's the one I was looking for. And I thought about this gift, and I heard Dr. Charles Stanley uh, use this illustration one time. He was talking about the spiritual gifts in terms of a cake and how you can kind of get an idea of how the spiritual gifts work if you think about it in this way or in this, with this illustration. He said, somebody, you know, imagine somebody bringing in a cake into a room for a birthday party. And it's real big. It's a two-layer cake, and it's got just the best icing. And what's your favorite kind of cake? Mine's chocolate. So I imagine a chocolate cake with lots of candles on there. And somebody comes in, and they bring this cake into, into the room, and they're coming towards the table. And all of a sudden, they do what my wife does sometimes. All right? And the cake just goes everywhere. And in this time of travesty, with the cake everywhere, you'll begin to see different people do different things, right? There will be that first person that comes to her side, right, and, and helps her up. Are you okay? Are, are you all right? And then you have the other person who's like, she should have watched out for that first step. It's a doozy, right? Then you have the person that says, I'll go get a rag, I'll go get a towel, I'll go get some water, and we'll clean this right up. Then you have a person who maybe is over here in the corner kind of snickering, <laughs> you know, laughing a little bit. But the point is that in that simple illustration, there are a myriad of people with a myriad uh, of different responses. And this is kind of a, a, a way we can look at the church, right? If it's a good thing that happens, or a tragedy that happens, or whatever happens in the life of the believers of the church... We come at it, and we come at it with our God-given gifts, and we respond to things differently in the body of Christ. And that's okay. That's a good thing. That's what makes us the church. And so today we're going to continue to kind of look at some of these gifts. But before we get into um, basically four more gifts today, I, I want to just address for a moment um, something that I brought out the first sermon about the different types of gifts. Remember we said there are three different types, three different kind of groups of gifts. There are the speaking gifts, right? We said there are the sign gifts, and we said there are the serving gifts, okay? So those are basically the three categories. It's not just only that. I think God is bigger than that, but from what we can see in the Word of God, we have those different areas. And the one I want to quickly just talk to you about, because we don't have much time, is the sign gifts. The sign gifts in the Bible are the gifts of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of speaking in tongues, and the gift of the interpretation of tongues. And there's a very vital point that needs to be made, and it's simply this. The sign gifts were for the authentication of the apostles and the early disciples and specifically the authentic, authentication of the message. Everybody say message. message. The message of the gospel. 
Because the gospel came in and it was basically different than what they had anticipated. They were believing for an earthly king to come and rule and to demolish all their oppressors, right? The people of Israel were. And so God wanted to make sure that Christ and his message and the message that he passed on to the apostles was heard and was validated and was authenticated. And so he gave some men and women in the apostolic period, in the beginning of the church, he gave them special sign gifts, gifts that could not be denied, gifts that said, this is the truth. This is the Christ. Jesus Jesus is the Savior of the world. He is the the long-awaited Messiah. And his apostles are speaking the true word of God. Now the sign gifts were given to authenticate that message. But once that message was confirmed, the sign gifts were no longer necessary. Does that make sense? It's, it's a very simple thought process. It's simply that once the gospel was presented and began to be dispersed throughout all the world, the sign gifts, even in 1 Corinthians, we read that the sign gifts would eventually begin to dissipate, to disappear. Not maybe all together, not all completely, but they are not as needed now that we have the full revelation of the Word of God. Let me put it this way in simple terms. We do not need the sign gifts today. Because we have the clear gospel message which has been fully confirmed through the word of God and the scriptures are enough. The scriptures are sufficient. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, You, Timothy, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known, listen, the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now listen to me very carefully carefully this morning. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. This does not mean that God cannot choose to heal someone. This does not mean that God cannot choose to perform a miracle. This does not even mean that God cannot choose to raise somebody from the dead. What it simply means is that God no longer, as far as I can tell, according to Scripture and according to observing fellow believers around me, God no longer gives the gifts of the signs, healings, miracles, speaking in tongues, because they were for the apostolic church, the beginning of the church, to authenticate the church, to authenticate the apostles, and ultimately to authenticate Christ Jesus as Messiah and Lord, and he is the only way to God. We know that now through the word of God. Again, this doesn't mean that these things cannot happen. I would not limit God in that way, but just let me give you some dangerous things that are happening in our culture. There is a church called Bethel Church in California, I believe it's in California, mega church, and just, I believe it was just recently, they decided that they were going to raise a two-year-old child from the dead. Now think about that for a moment. They were going to raise a two-year-old child from the dead. Now, listen, is that possible? Yes. Here's the problem with that. God is not a lap dog. And if you don't have the gift of healing, you don't have the gift of raising someone from the dead, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is the child is going to remain deceased. The church is going to make God look like a fool. And at best case scenario, the people, the mom, the dad of that little girl are going to be told you just didn't have enough faith. That's not right. It's not right. So we have to have a proper understanding of the gifts and of the sign gifts. Now, again, hear me clearly. I do not want to limit God. If someone had the gift of healings, where should they be? How about a hospital? Amen? So so it's important to understand. I would love to do an entire sermon on just these gifts, but I'm not going to go there. If you want an individual discussion, I will have that with you, and I will show you through the Word of God 
how I believe that the gifts have ceased, these specific sign gifts have ceased, not completely, and only for the specific reason that we do not need them anymore. The gospel verifies itself when the Spirit of God comes into the heart of someone and transforms their mind and their soul and their entire being and shows them the truth of the gospel through the preaching of the word. Just by way of note, you know what gift is elevated above all other gifts? It's the gift of prophecy. And we learned already that the gift of prophecy is simply speaking forth the truth of what God has said. So when we preach, when we teach, when we speak forth the truth of God's word, that is all someone needs to come to Christ and to accept him as Savior as the Spirit works through the word of God and impresses that truth upon their heart. Amen? I know that was a long introduction, but I wanted to address it. But let's continue on with these other gifts this morning. And I want to tell you up front, I am not an expert on this. There's much debate. There has been for a long time. But there are some gifts that some people think, oh, these were for the apostolic time in the church. And there are some gifts that are no longer uh, applicable. But we're going to just look at these next four gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you're there, say amen. All right, I'll give you some more time. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 1 through 11, Paul says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you speak through this message this morning, through my lips, Lord, I pray that you would just just communicate what you would have to say, not what I have to say. I pray that you would give us insight into the gifts. More importantly, God, I pray that you would empower us to employ these gifts in service to you and to the King and in your kingdom. God, I ask that you would just open our minds, open our hearts, and just be glorified in this moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are on number eight. If you wonder why you're starting on number eight, it's because of the past sermons. Here's number eight, a word of wisdom. We see that in verse 8 in the very first part. He says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Now, this is one of the speaking gifts, and we know that because we see it is a word of wisdom, right? So it's obviously a speaking gift. It's not just wisdom for wisdom's sake. It's not just keeping up information and applying it to your own life. It is a word of wisdom that is meant to be for other people in the body of Christ. And so word here is a speaking gift, and it always involves speaking wisdom, not simply having or possessing wisdom. Uh, This could have been a gift in the apostolic age. It was obviously a gift in the apostolic age, and it was revelatory in nature, um, kind of alongside with prophecy. But wisdom is, is simply living out truth discovered, okay? Living out truth discovered. It's a word of wisdom is simply sharing truth discovered so that other people in the church will obey. So it's basically, it's kind of like the gift of exhortation in a sense. Here's a simple definition. The gift of wisdom is the ability to communicate gospel truth, here's the important part, to life situations. It's the ability to communicate gospel truth or truths, not just simply the gospel, but how the gospel impacts and influences the lives of others in real practical ways. 
You see, there's a problem in the church today of people wanting real answers for their life. And so we have all these churches coming out and they say, we just want to be real with people and we want to just meet them where they are. And that's all good and right. But listen, the motivation for change, the source of change, are you listening to say amen? In the believer's life is the same source in terms of how you got saved. You got saved by grace through faith. Amen? You got saved. You trusted in Christ and your eternal destination changed. You went from hell to heaven because you had faith and trust in what Christ did on the cross. That he paid the sin you couldn't pay. That's the only way anybody ever gets to heaven. Amen? It's not by works of righteousness lest any man should boast. And so it's when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ... That's how you became born again. That's the gospel. We don't leave the gospel at the time of salvation for us. The gospel is what changes us as believers in Jesus Christ. This is a very difficult concept, not to, 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 to conceive in our minds, but to play out practically in our lives. Now, I don't have children, so I don't pretend to know or tell anybody what to do about their kids outside of the word of God. <laughs> amen? Good, you did an amen. Because it's about God's word, right? And I thought long and hard about this week about how I've tried to communicate to some of my relatives and my, grand, uh, my, my nieces and nephews in terms of the word of God and the gospel. You see, we should start from a young age in terms of influencing them to think, listen, just as you had faith in Christ to be saved, you now should walk in that same faith. Walk from victory, not for victory. You act from what God has done for you. Everything you do, the motivation for being nice to your brother or sister, the reason that you don't uh, hit them, the reason that you forgive them, the reason you love them is not because mom or dad said so, not because even the Bible says so. It's because of what Christ has done for you. That's the motivation behind all of it. And listen, as far as the gifts are concerned... It's the motivation behind all of the gifts. The gift of wisdom is the ability to do what I just did, to communicate to you. You want victory in your life. You want success in your life from a spiritual standpoint. It's motivated from the gospel message. Therein lies true wisdom. It's the mystery of the gospel, Paul says. Over and over, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the gospel. It's what brings power into the believer's life. I want you to quickly just look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You don't have to go far, so just go back a few chapters. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want you to see verses 6 through 12. Paul is speaking, of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Listen to what he says about wisdom. He says, yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a what? Mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9, but just as it is written, things which eye has not seen nor ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. You see, when the Spirit of God comes into your life, when you're born again and you've trusted in Christ, you automatically understand the mystery, the wisdom of the gospel. But the gift of wisdom helps apply the mystery of the gospel to everyday situations. It might look like simply telling somebody who comes to you and says, you know, my car, it's running, but man, it just not, it doesn't, doesn't look good, doesn't smell good, right? 
Wisdom, the person with the gift of wisdom might say, well, let's, let's see, what's going to most bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ and the gospel? According to the gospel, what should you do about your vehicle? Should you go out and spend $400 a month with a new car payment that you know you can't afford? And then you know the bank will come collect on that note, and you know it might be repossessed, and you know that your name, along with the name of Christ, will be drug through the mud. See, a person with wisdom would say, that's probably not the wisest thing to do according to the gospel. Amen? Pretty simple. How about the word of knowledge? You say, that sounds pretty similar. This is number nine, found in the second part of verse eight. He says, and to another, the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. Obviously, we have that same word, word. So it's a speaking gift. It's meant to be spoken always involves speaking knowledge, not just having knowledge. And the gift of knowledge is the God-given ability. Are you listening? Are you with me? Say amen. amen. To comprehend spiritual truth and to verbally impart that truth to others. Now this has less to do with practical wisdom and more to do with just understanding the deep things of God. Understanding very deep spiritual truths. This last Friday night, we had the night of Christmas, and I ran into somebody that I don't see very frequently, but I like him. He's a brother in Christ of mine, and it is Jason Neal. And Jason Neal, I think, has the word of wisdom as a gift. This guy is just one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life in terms of Bible knowledge. It's amazing. And people like this, they just have a, an ability and a gift to know not just the Bible, but geography of the Bible, right? The, the history of the Bible, the details of the Bible. And then to understand that on a deep level in terms of its relation to the promised Messiah, the scarlet thread throughout the entire scriptures. The gift of knowledge is the God-given ability to comprehend spiritual truth and to verbally impart that truth to others. John MacArthur says it this way, God gives certain of his saints a special ability to study his word and to discover the full meaning of the text and context of individual words and phrases and of related passages and truths and thereby help provide understanding for others. Now it should come as no surprise that some believers understand and comprehend the Bible better than others. These are they that have been given the gift of knowledge and it is their responsibility to communicate that knowledge that insight, that mystery to others to impart to them that knowledge. Now, early in my preaching ministry, almost seven years ago, I didn't understand why people didn't understand. I, and, and even to this day, I have to catch myself. Let me explain what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll read a passage and God will reveal to me, you know, what is happening in that passage. And we see the context and we see the main point and we see the author and what he is trying to say. And I know the spirit of God is speaking through that man. And the main point is this, and it's clear as day. It's a little bit deep, but it's clear as day. And it's right there. And God is saying it to me. He's shouting it to me. And somebody in the audience says, I don't understand what in the world you were saying and what that was saying. I don't know what was, that's all about. You know why that is? It's not because you're dumb. It's because some people have this gift, and it's their job to articulate that gift, that, that thing that is being taught to you. Now, now, don't misunderstand me. All of Scripture is able to be studied and understood. God will reveal it to you if you search out the Scriptures and you study. But to some... And, and this would make sense for pastors, amen, it would make sense for pastors to have this gift, this gift of understanding the deep things of God and then communicating that to the whole church. That's an important gift, amen? It also reminds me that there is no room for pride in any of the gifts, it's not like I'm sitting here and there's something really smart and special about me that says, man, I know these things and you people don't. You see, that, that, at the beginning of Romans, we tackled that. We're not to think too highly or too lowly of ourselves. We're to think adequately and appropriately about ourselves. All our gifts are from God, so we have no reason to brag. We're simply vessels that communicate what God has communicated through us. We, give the, we have the gifts and we use them to glorify and edify Christ. Amen? Now... 
Those two gifts are, again, they, it needs to be reiterated, they are speaking gifts. So it's not that you just have wisdom, it's not that you have knowledge, it's that you have those things and then you speak that to other people. It doesn't have to be from a podium. It can be sitting in a chair across from somebody in your home and you impart those things to others. Uh, it doesn't mean the believer who does not have the gift of words of knowledge is excused from studying and understanding. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us that. Paul said to Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So don't walk away this morning and say, well, I don't have to really study the Bible because Dave is supposed to study and he has that gift and then he'll just break it down for me. That's not what we're saying. Everybody with me? Say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, that's important. Those with the gift of knowledge have a propensity to understand and to verbally communicate the deep truths of God's word as it has been specifically given to them. Who can have the gift of wisdom? Everybody say anyone. Anyone can have this gift. This gift, obviously, like we just said, is a must for pastors and teachers. If you're going to teach the word of God, you should probably have this gift. So you need to ask yourself this morning, have I been gifted with the word of knowledge? Number 10 is faith. Faith. He says in verse number 9 of chapter 12, to another faith by the same Spirit. Notice it's all coming from the same person, the Spirit of the living God. All believers are called to have faith. Let me say that again. All believers are called to have faith. But there are some of you that have this extraordinary gift. And it is an amazing thing to see lived out in the body of Christ. Colossians 2.6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk in him. How? By faith. You receive Christ by faith. You are to walk in your Christian life by faith. Hebrews 11.6. And without, say it church. Oh, we can do better than that. And without, it is impossible to please him. Who's him? It's God. Think about that astonishing fact for a moment. If it's not of faith, God is not pleased. Uh-oh. <laughs> so whatever we do in our Christian lives, it must be by faith. But to the person who has this gift, when they walk in the Spirit, this gift is intensified. All of us are to have faith. Some of us, we look at and we're like, we're going to do what? You want to do what? You expect God to do what? These are likely the people with the gift of faith. The believer with the gift of faith has the capacity to see something that needs to be done. We're talking on a large scale and to believe God to do it through that person even though that thing looks impossible. The believer with the gift of faith has the capacity to see something that needs to be done and to believe God will do it through him even if it looks impossible. Now this is something that's pretty easily ascertained. You can know if you have the gift of faith pretty quickly because if you're a pessimist about all things relating to the church, you probably don't have the gift of faith. No, no, we can't do that. We've never done it like that before. No, 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 no. Are you kidding me? There's no way we could raise that much money. See, the person with the gift of faith, it's not that they believe in themselves. It's, they, it's that they believe in God Almighty. They have a special, a special relationship with God to where they just, they just know, they just have confidence, not in themselves, not even in the church, but in God, that God will do it, that God's going to get it done. That if we just step out and do what he says we should do, that God will see it through. This person is a person of vision with firm conviction that God will bring it to pass. Such a person dreams great dreams and tackles great tasks for God. This is a gift I wish I had. <laughs> but I know that God in his providence has put me here this morning to look out and see many of you who have this gift. And it brings me great joy to know that I don't have to do all that. That God is raising up leaders within our church that have great faith to get things done. 
John MacArthur said, The gift of faith is the intensive ability to trust God in difficult and demanding ways. So it's not necessarily just for positive things. Yeah, we can build that. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can start that women's ministry. Yeah, we can help the homeless. Yeah, we can do all these. It's also, if somebody is going through something that, that is just, just from the devil himself, the person with the gift of faith is able to trust God in the most difficult situations and circumstances. Many times, husband and wife, one has the gift and one doesn't, and, and it can lead to some interesting conversations. What do you mean we need to give that money to wherever? What, what, do you, what do you mean? We can't do that. That doesn't make practical, logical sense. Well, I just believe that God wants us to do that, and he's going to do it, and he wants to do it. And in our marriages, we should be a little bit more open and understanding if God is speaking to your spouse and they have the gift of faith at least consider amen and in the church we need less negative Nancy's and more positive Peter's people with faith that step out of the boat amen the gift from MacArthur, I want to finish it. The gift of faith is the intensive ability to trust God in difficult and demanding ways. It is the ability to trust him in the face of overwhelming obstacles and human impossibilities. Came across a beautiful, a great, great illustration of this. How many of you have ever heard of a man named Adonor, Adonor, good grief, Adoniram Judson? I can never say his, word, his name right. Can you say it for me, Mrs. Neal? Adoniram. All right. Thank you for that. Adoniram Judson. He graduated from college and seminary. He received a call to a fashionable church in Boston to become its assistant pastor. This was a long, long time ago. Uh, fa fashionable means reputable and wealthy and, you know, just it was one of these like mega churches. That's how we think about it now, right? Everyone congratulated him. His mother and sister rejoiced that he could live at home with them and do his life work. But Judson, Judson took shook his head. My work is not here, he said. God is calling me beyond the seas. To stay here, even to serve God in his ministry, I feel would be only partial obedience, and I could not be happy at that. Judson had a vision for the fields of Burma and dared to believe that God would do great work, a great work there through him. He preached to the Buddhists there, listen, for six years. Six years. When have you ever done anything for God for six straight years? Many of you have, but listen to this next part. Every first Sunday of the month, he and his devoted wife would celebrate the Lord's Supper and would say, at the conclusion, we are the church of Jesus in Burma. Someone wrote to Mr. Judson after he had been there for five years to find out the prospects for the conversion of the heathen. He answered, as bright as the promises of God. Although it cost him a great struggle, he left mother and sister and patiently perse persevered for six years, believing God would do a great work. Much of his work went unnoticed and unrecognized, and he had very little converts. But today, the fashionable church in Boston still stands rich and strong. But Judson's church in Burma and his churches in Burma have 50,000 converts. And the influence of his consecrated life is felt around the world. He was a man of faith. You see, the person of faith does great things, not because they are great, but because they believe in a great God. I feel like the Spirit of God is simply telling me to, to, to just say this right now. So I'm just going to say it. Some of you have quit. You just quit. I, I, again, I don't know. I, this is obviously awkward, and I don't know why God's telling me to tell you this, but you've quit in, in some type of ministry, something that God has wanted you to do, something that has been a passion of yours, something that you believe God at one point. You, you had faith to, to see it through at one point, but for whatever reason, you've just stopped. You're not doing what God has called you to do. I would implore you to have more faith. Carry out the call of God on your life. Don't give up. The believer with the gift of faith will always be given to prayer. You cannot separate the two. If you're not a prayer, you don't have the gift of faith. It's pretty, pretty much that simple. 
person with the gift of faith knows how to pray, knows when to pray, is consistent in prayer, never ceases to pray, they understand that prayer is the conduit that gets things done, especially the big things. Those with the gift of faith have a special ability to lay claim on the promises of God. In essence, they're activating God. They know that if they just cry out to God, that God will do it, and they pray for that thing to happen. I want you to quickly, we're almost done this morning, quickly turn to James. James chapter 5. Let me hear those pages rustling. That will encourage me, and I believe encourage those around you. James chapter 5, verse 16. Many of you have heard this before, this account about Elijah. In James chapter 5, verse 16, the second part, right about in the middle, it says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. It's saying he was just like you and me, just average person. And he prayed earnestly or fervently that it would what? Not rain. Have you ever prayed that it would not rain? You know the last time I prayed that it would not rain? I can remember it very vividly. I was probably like 11 years old, and I was now kneeling down by my bedside, and it was after church service, and I was praying that it would not rain so that we could go to my Uncle Jim's pool. I wanted the sun to be out. I wanted it to be shining. I wanted it to be hot so my parents would take us to that pool and go swimming. Now, listen, that was an innocent but pure act of faith on my part. And I can never remember, you're going to laugh at me, I can never remember not pr- or praying and then not being able to go to the pool. And I think that was a simple grace of my Savior who loves me that much that he would say, you're like, God wouldn't do that. Uh, Can we read the rest of this? Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured out rain, and the earth produced its fruit. See, the person with the gift of faith has no problem believing this. They look at that and they're like, yeah, that sounds cool. I want to do that. I want to do something like that. Let's move some mountains, right? We are all called to have faith, but the person with the gift of faith, man, do we need that in our church. And I think I spent a little bit more time on that gift this morning simply because if you have the gift of faith, you need to be working for the Lord right here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. You need to be seeing what others who have weak faith can't see. You need to be claiming what we don't claim. You need to be that part of the body that lifts the rest of us up to believe that God wants to do something in this place. Amen? Do you have the gift of faith? Lastly, as we burn through this last one, discernment is found in verse 10 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. It might say distinguishing of spirits. Maybe you see that. Distinguishing of spirits. Another simple term for it, as I've labeled it, is discernment. You see, every message spoken, every message spoken, say it with me, every message spoken has one of three sources. Everything you hear, everything that comes into your iPod earbuds or your, what's the most popular one now? It's not Beats anymore. AirPods, AirPods, all right. Whoever's speaking to you through those, whoever you hear on Sunday morning, whoever you hear on the TV, whatever televangelist you hear, listen, that message has a source, and it's from one of three places. Hopefully, it's from the first thing, the Spirit of God. Hopefully, the Spirit of God is speaking through that person. The person with the gift of discernment can say, yeah, that, that's from the Lord. That's from the Spirit of the living God. But another place it might come from is the Spirit of man. Simple flesh. It's my own ideas. It's apart from God. It's not necessarily evil, but it's just from me. And then you have the spirit of the devil. The Christian with the gift of discernment has the special ability to recognize a message spoken as being from the spirit, the flesh, or the enemy. You see, Satan is the great deceiver. Amen? Let's let it be so. Maybe we shouldn't say amen there. (laughs) He is the great deceiver. That wasn't a trick. He is the great deceiver. He is, the Bible calls him in John 8, 44, the father of all lies. And he attacks and infiltrates the church. Now, now listen, listen to me. This is really important. 
We need desperately the people with the gift of discernment to step up in the body of Christ because it's becoming destroyed from within. The enemy is infiltrating the church with people with false theology and false doctrine and things that tickle the ears and makes me feel really good about myself, but it's not from God. And you go online and you listen to these little snidbits and it sounds good and it sounds encouraging and you're like, yeah, that's great, thanks for that. And it's from either the flesh, or worst case scenario, it's from the devil or his his demons. See, often the devil's greatest weapon is to counterfeit God's word. He takes a little bit of God's word and then untruth, and he mixes them together, and he says, here, partake. And before you know it, you wonder, what happened? We need people with the gift of discernment who can hear those messages And cry out with love and say, that's not from God. Some of the shows you're watching and listening to, some of the talk shows, some of the news shows, you need to be able to lean on people who have this gift. The more I see around our churches, the more I think we do not have the gift of discernment. God, give us people with the gift of discernment to not believe the lies of the enemy. He twists scripture. He takes it out of context, and ultimately he wants to misrepresent who God is. The believer with the gift of discernment sees through the falsity and can distinguish and expose the lies. And believers within the body of Christ, and listen, believers within this body of Christ, should listen to and heed the warnings of those within the church who have the gift of discernment. Now, now, if you have the gift of discernment, you probably know, you know I, I have the gift of discernment. God has blessed me with that gift. Thank God he did. It's also very, very aggravating to see believers run off cliffs because some teacher, some false prophet said something, some, some person who is either speaking from the flesh or the enemy, the devil himself or his demons, has said something, and you take it and you carry it. Oh, God wants to bless me, give me health, wealth, prosperity, and all these things, and Then he doesn't do it, and then you have family problems, and then you have health problems, and you think, what is wrong with me? And your faith decreases and decreases. Pretty soon you find yourself far away from God. The person with discernment comes in and says, don't believe that. That's demonic. That's false. That's not from God. And your response and my response should be humility. Is what they're saying true? You see, the person with discernment always starts and says, it's the word of God. This Thus saith the word. This person said this, but here's what God said. That's what the Jews of Berea did when they first heard the gospel message from Paul. They tested Paul's word against the word of God. And that is the inclination of those with the gift of discernment. They ask, is this true according to the word of God? Do we have that video, Justin? I want to introduce you. Maybe you've already seen him. Peter Popoff. That's a real name. That's a real name of a real minister of God. Now, let's watch this commercial. I came across this the other night, late, 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 watching late night TV. This guy came on in the gift of discernment. I wanted to reach through that screen and strangle this man. Let's watch this. Okay. Now, listen, I, I mean, you don't even need the gift of discernment for that one. Look at the guy's hair, right? Look, look at his name. Now, now, in all seriousness, I don't want to tear somebody down, but I mean, I mean, seriously, church, we have to be more discerning, and we need to listen to people with the gift of discernment. Amen? Amen. I hope that those with the gift of discernment can be able to see some, through something as silly as that. But folks, today in our churches, it's not happening. We have people... We have people believing they can raise a two-year-old little girl from the dead and proclaiming it to all and then dragging the name of Jesus Christ through that mud and mire. We need to rely on those people with the gift of discernment. And listen, more so than that, we need to have discernment ourselves. And you can have it just like anybody else through the living word of God. Check these things to see if they are so, if they are true. Not only that... The gift of discernment goes further than comparing the message of the teacher or preacher or whoever to the word of God. The person with the gift of discernment just knows because it's God-given. I want you to look 
at Acts chapter 16. You don't have to turn there. I know we're running late. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 17. Listen to this. This is just, this, this is interesting. Acts chapter 16, verse number 16. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us. So she's possessed. Who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Verse 17. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God. True or false? That's true. These men, she's saying of Paul and those who are with Paul, these are servants, bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. True or false? True. Verse 18, she continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came, about, came out at that very moment. Listen, this girl was saying all the right things, but she was not speaking from the Holy Spirit. And as a believer in this church, you need to be aware that just because somebody's saying something true, it doesn't make them from God. Here's where it gets a little scary, and here's where the person of discernment really comes in and, and is effective in the local body of Christ. Many people could say Jesus is God and the gospel is true and all these things. Doesn't mean their word is from the Spirit of God. See, those with the gift of discernment are the Holy Spirit's watchdogs. They are inspectors. They are his counterfeit experts to give to whom he gives special insight and understanding. Do you have the gift of discernment? Now, just to wrap things up, many things I didn't get to this morning. Hospitality. Gift of hospitality. What is that? That's pretty straightforward and simple. You just love loving people and you do it with your own resources sometimes it looks like bringing somebody into your house from the church you provide food you provide shelter you provide things for them and, and you just welcome you are a welcoming hospitable person another one that we didn't get to was the gift of evangelism it's pretty self-explanatory too right you tell people listen not about church about the gospel about what christ has done for them you speak clearly and boldly and confidently and articulately the message that Christ died for you. That's a simple, straightforward gift that you know you have or you do not. Everyone is called to hospitality. Everyone is called to evangelize. Amen? But here's the disclaimer. This is, this is my best understanding of the gifts as I've relied on the Spirit of God to give me truth in these matters. It's by no means exact. It's by no means complete or perfect. This sermon and sermon series is not an exhaustive list. I believe there are other gifts out there that we might not even know about. Some of you during this sermon series have come to me and said, I don't know what I have. I thought I had this gift, but now I'm not sure after you preached. And I'm like, man, that's done the opposite of what I want to happen, right? But here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you know your gifts. So Dave, why did you just spend four weeks telling me about my spiritual gifts? Are you listening? It doesn't matter if you know what specific gifts you have. It helps, but that's not the point of every single passage that talks about spiritual gifts. It emphasizes the gift giver, the Spirit of God, and that he's the one that employs the gift, and it emphasizes that you actually practice and exercise your gifts. How silly would it be this Christmas in three days to unwrap gifts and then just leave them forever underneath the tree? To never touch them or open them up or play with them or utilize them. The emphasis in the way that you and I know what our spiritual gifts are and employ our spiritual gifts is we utilize them, we do them, we walk by the Spirit so that we can see God work through us. How can I know for sure that I'm using my spiritual gift? Three quick points and then we're done. Number one, return to the altar. That's what Romans 12, 1 says. 
Romans 12, 1, return to the altar. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to what? To present or to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. You need to be offering yourself constantly. Lord, it's your life. Do with me as you will. All my gifts that you have given to me, help me to use them. Employ my gifts. Do what you want with me. And offer yourself your body, your talents, your ministries, your gifts, your brain, your everything, offer it to God. That is a constant thought of the believer and the believer's mindset. Present your bodies. Here I am. Use me. See, the problem with a living sacrifice is that it tends to get up off the altar, doesn't it? You're like me. One day, today, you might say, God, use me, use my gifts. And then tomorrow, you're like, I don't want to be really involved in the church. See, we always have that option. God does not force us to be here. Are you listening? God does not force us to be here. If you don't want to be here, listen, I want you here. I don't know what to tell you. Are you using your gifts for the body of Christ? Is church just an obligation? Return to the altar. Secondly, rely on the Spirit. See, returning to the altar is big picture stuff. Relying on the Spirit is the day-to-day stuff. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it tells us exactly how this happens. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one in the same Spirit works all these things. It's the Spirit that does the work. Some of you are like, oh man, now i got to do that. i got to do that gift. i got to do that. You ain't got to do nothing but say, God, here I am, and submit to Him, and watch Him work. Watch the Spirit work through you. Lastly, remember the purpose of your gift. Remember the purpose of your gift. Ephesians 4.12 tells us that the gifts were been, have been given for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. Listen, listen, are you listening? To the building up of the body of Christ. Let me come down here so you listen. I want you to use your gifts out there. But mainly the gifts are purposed and intentional to be used in the body not a building in the body now listen we're not having church next week at all no Sunday service at all and here's what I want you to do in the time from now this is how you're going to worship you see Romans talking about the gifts Romans chapter 12 chapter 12 verse 1 the very end of it you know what it says this is your spiritual act of worship this is how you worship By utilizing, employing, serving, helping, prophesying, teaching, encouraging, exhorting, on and on with the gifts. This is how you worship. It's not standing in a sanctuary that's part of worship, but it's we got to get rid of that idea of worship. Worship is when the body of Christ says, I have been gifted by the Spirit of the living God to exhort and lift up my brothers and sisters in Christ. My life is not about me. My life is not about my stinking kids. It's about the glory of God, and that happens through the church of God, and we need to employ our gifts. That's what needs to happen, church. And so from now until January 5th is the next time that we'll be in this place. But it doesn't have to be the next time we see one another. You should be loving people in this church, left and right, finding out their needs, using your spiritual gifts, knocking on their door, bringing them food if they're sick, knocking on their door, bringing a word of exhortation and encouragement, ringing them on the phone. I don't know why I said that, 1950s, ringing them on the phone, calling them up, emailing them. We have all this technology, and we can message somebody in a split second, and yet we don't use it for the glory of God. Redeem the time you have. Redeem the gifts you've been given. Use it to bring glory and honor. Listen, first to the church. When the church, when the bride of Christ is lifted up, Christ is lifted up. Can you commit to do that, church? If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to begin to walk in the Spirit, rely on the Spirit, obeying every moment, offering yourself as a living sacrifice to God, 
It's your reasonable. He says it's your reasonable. That's your basic form of worship. If you come in here and worship with your mouths on Sunday, but don't live for other believers and use your gifts to build up the body of Christ, if that's not your overall goal in life, you're doing life wrong. You're doing it wrong. And you wonder why you're miserable, and you wonder why your finances are out of whack, and you wonder why your kids are going astray, and you wonder all these things. Come back to the altar. Put your life on it. Husbands, put your family's lives on it. It's on you to do what God has called you to do. Use your spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ, and you do it by walking in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we